Oh, perfect. So perfect. this ended up being one of those weird impromptu revival deals where I went to look at this car to buy it. We were just going to trailer at home. It had a lot of issues. Now this fella had a lot of stuff from a salvage yard that he must have lived close to. And so, you know, we just jumped in. This guy was wide eyed and I just started fixing this car with his old scrap parts right in front of him here. And uh, we all had kind of a good time doing it here. The radiator hose was blown. I kind of made a radiator hose out of something else and kind of made some bushings and whatever kind of got the carb working well enough to you know ultimately take the car for a drive and see what we had it ended up kind of running decent enough to start it up and putts down the road and you know kind of the rest is history here not something i normally do but it was pretty fun we could only document so much but anyway we got everything together and quickly hit the road so we've already done a revival on this man's property on his own car and they said that we should probably trailer it but now it runs and idles so we're just seeing if the transmission works so i've never been a big fan of automatics so there's already two it had no transmission fluid when we showed up so that's always good it's already in third okay well, that's interesting 20 mile an hour 20 mile an hour we were suspicious that we were suspicious that it had a blown head gasket because it had a blown radiator hose. And you know, normally people blow stuff out and then they keep driving it and it's ruined. But in this case, you know, he said he didn't do that, which he seems like a really nice, honest guy. And you know, I don't think he did. It was rolling smoke for a while, but some finicking with the carb and whatnot, it seems okay. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not good, but it's not bad. And that price is pretty good. I mean, I'm flooring the brakes right now, so we're gonna ignore this part. Ugh. And these are power brakes. They're probably not power anymore. What a boat. Ready to get I'm trying to two foot it because it does not want to run anymore. So going down through some steep hills with this thing. The brake pedal is suspicious to say the least. Doesn't do a lot. It's more like a suggestion than a brake, if anything. Beautiful scenery though. How's it running? Well, I can fire it up. It's starting to break up pretty bad, but hard to say if it's the very minuscule sized gas tank on the hills or what. So, but as long as I don't stop at a stop sign or stoplight, we're fine. So good thing that never happens when you're driving two or three hours. Right. Oh, hopes that you hit the hole maybe. All right, we're on the wrong side of the tracks here, but can't seem to keep the car running so I don't know we're gonna have to figure something out at least we got a nice campsite look at that live in luxury kind of oh hang on a sec mint That's a very good vacuum. Yeah. Hot garbage for sure. It's like five degrees retarded. That's what you want. Got it loose. Just had to casually take the vacuum advance off because, you know, that's normal. That's normal things you do. As much as I love driving down the road with 
zero degrees of ignition timing. Well, unfortunately, this distributor has probably been in here forever, and I can't seem to get it to move, at least to move freely, where I can do anything with it. So I'm going to hook the vacuum advanced to manifold vacuum, not hammer on it very hard, and just hope we have enough timing with misusing the vacuum advance for this specific scenario that doesn't hurt the thing. I don't know if you can hear in the video, we're starting to misfire pretty bad. Uh, it's getting dark out. It seems like we got some electrical prevalence, which all these things are to be expected with a $1,000 car from 1967. So it'll be a miracle if we make it. So, not my typical MO here to put stuff on a trailer. I don't think I've ever actually done this before, but this is kind of crossed over to where I would consider it to almost be irresponsible to try and drive this home the rest of the way. The brakes being sketchy anyway, and then when the engine shuts off, the brakes get real bad. And we have to drive through a hilly area, and this is the point where it gets unsafe for other people on the road. And really for me to keep driving it, would I probably make it? Yeah, is it a super irresponsible thing to do just solely to do for YouTube when actually we came with a trailer to trailer the thing anyway and then we're pleasantly surprised that it actually ran? So it just makes sense to me to not kill someone else on the road and trailer at home and go from there. We're only like an hour away, so this doesn't make any sense. So fast forward here, I have the Mercury in the garage, and I was just uh, gonna work on this myself, not show any of it on the internet. Um, it's a lot more fun just to work on things without filming them, and you guys online probably see 10% of what I actually do as far as wrench turning goes. But uh, this turned into quite the high level of debacleville here, so <laughs> you guys are gonna come along with me for this one. Uh, this is something I've never had to deal with before, so and I'm going to get have to get really weirdly creative to fix it, I'm sure. So with that, here we go. So my first indication that something might be squirrely on this thing was that the distributor actually had side-to-side -side motion ever so slightly when it was bolted in, but it didn't look like the shaft moved. Anyway, you know, I could see where someone had hit on the distributor to try and rotate it. And in all fairness, the ignition timing was terrible. So I think someone had tried to adjust it and possibly crack the distributor. So you can see all this tomfoolery here. Um, I heated it up, went in to try and rotate it myself, and it just quickly snapped off. And now we have this going on. Very exciting. So getting this out of here, and it's it is stuck in there really good. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do, but the slide hammer is looking better and better. Got our rickety old MIG welder out, and I think I'm gonna sacrifice this piece here of my slide hammer. I'm just gonna try and buzz around that guy there, and with any luck, I can jack this distributor up and out of here. But, uh, oh boy, things I don't love doing. You guys better behave yourselves or this is going to happen to you too. You see the type of treatment you get when you don't behave? You know what they say, if women don't find you handsome, well, they'll probably find you stupid, so, and ugly. In this case, you know, that's ugly and I felt stupid for doing it, but if it works, ah, uh, I don't know. 
let's beat the snot out of that thing and see what happens. Oh, probably should have just done that from the beginning. The scary part is it's broken on the end. Got it out with minimal damage, as you can see. So I think I'm just going to weld all this back up and then reinstall it, and it'll be probably okay. I'm just kidding. I have another one. So this is from my 64 Galaxy, and this is why I never throw anything away. Uh, now, a lot of you guys in the comments seem to fault me for only working on Fords, you know, and insinuate that I don't like GM or Chrysler. And none of that's necessarily the case, you know. If you stick to one brand, maybe just a couple different engine families, and you do a lot of this stuff, it's really convenient because often, like in scenarios like this, you just tend to have a bunch of extra parts on the shelf, you know, and you can get through stuff like this a lot easier without really spending any money to do it. So, you know, times like this, obviously, pretty handy. One nice thing about old cars that's a lot different with modern stuff is things stayed the same for many, many years. An FE is an FE is an FE. So this distributor, again, was from a 64 352 FE, and it's kind of a neat model. It bears the Famoco logo, and it actually has this little oiling flapper on the side. So very much so a vintage unit. By 67, you know, it bore the Autolite name instead, didn't have a flapper. You know, is that better, is that worse? I don't know. But all things considered, essentially other than those things, it should be the same and our points should transfer over. This has an old Protronics module that when I bought my 64 Galaxy, it was burned up and I just opted to go to a Pro Build Igniter 3 distributor that had overall more capability but i think we can put points in this guy and you know she'll sing in here just fine and in classic form it looks like it's going to fight me the whole way i can and you probably can too see some remnants of what looks like red Loctite in there, which I'm not surprised. I don't know how this locates itself because it has one screw. It probably has a little thing that goes, uh, like a stud that goes into a screw hole under here, but I'm betting you, since the way these original Protronics were designed with this reluctor wheel, you know, this might have moved on someone, caused issues, and eventually someone Loctited this in super tight. So I guess, we're going to get the little hand torch and see if we can get this out of here. If not, I'll have to drill it, which I really don't want to do. You should really never use Loctite in your distributor unless you want to cause yourself a lot of pain. You can see here, you know, this one no one had to monkey with to install the Protronics, but this one up here, so, you know, clearly has Loctite all over it. One of the reasons I opted to replace this distributor, other than just buy a module for it and everything, and this is one of the reasons I actually don't like Ford distributors. DuraSpark, all of them are the same. The advanced mechanism is under the advanced plate, which is very annoying to get to. You can easily, while disassembly, when this is in the car, drop something down inside. So not very nice to work with. But we got this one apart here. And the reason I went away from this one, if I hold this here, is it had a hard time returning to center so it's kind of got some floaty timing where basically you'd set the timing rev the engine then the timing would kind of hang in it and ford did some interesting stuff and i've seen it in chrysler's also and you don't see this in aftermarket distributors and so basically here's your advanced weights now this one is hooked right to the spring it's engaged right away but you see here this other spring that's heavier is not and the idea behind this was 
was to set timing. The light spring um, into the throttle jumps timing up pretty quick. And then the heavy spring then makes contact and then slows the mechanical advance rate from that point. So pretty cool dynamic way that they used to do it mechanically. In aftermarket units, you don't see this. You can see the advance mechanisms here are pretty gummed up, offering some extra resistance. You see that should fall in. This one's really bad. Let's just take a moment to appreciate how absolutely way overbuilt this Famoco distributor is. So these advanced weights, they have actually a bearing pressed in, which is pretty cool. You look up here on the shaft and it's uh, knurled for an oil channel. You know, I see why they went away from, from this. This would have been very expensive to manufacture versus the later cheaper models. So in this case, even from 64 to 67, the uh, saying rings true, you know, they don't make them like they used to. All right, we're looking good. Everything moves, returns to center easy. You know, that's what you want. We'll be able to set timing um, and it'll stay there. And then, you know, it won't be fluttering around. So I think we're good. Put it back in, I suppose. My favorite thing about working on cars is I just had this distributor in my hand, uh, obviously, and I can't find it in this garage for the life of me. Gotta be kidding me. Under the engine bay, you know, over on the workbench. It just like fell into the fourth dimension, apparently. Good grief. So stupid. Notorious for doing stuff like that. Lose my own head if it wasn't attached. Short intermission here to bring mama's horses in while she's away. There he is. There you go. I'm amazed you can get him off a pasture with just a little treat, but we'll take it. Couple of Oberlander horses, German drafts. Okay, let's get back to what we were doing. All right, so fast forward a couple days here. I got distracted with some other things. I'm finally getting back to this project. So we got the distributor all reassembled. It's lubed up with uh, engine assembly lube to go in, you know, just so it slides in easy and the cam gear mesh is good and all that good stuff. So with that, let's finally, after a few days here, drop this bad boy in. So I could make this really easy on myself. When I pulled the last distributor out, we were on top dead center of the engine of cylinder one so it would be really easy to just install the distributor but let's say for your guys' sake you don't have this scenario and this is kind of scary for a lot of people so i'm just going to go ahead and screw it up for us here we'll jump the starter solenoid and actually when we do this you just want the coil to be unhooked you think well you don't have the key on but actually when you jump the starter solenoid uh, with a resistive lead style ignition, uh, the starter solenoid will actually send a full 12 volts to the coil when cranking. And if you don't have a distributor or anything hooked up, you can actually burn up your coil. So we're good there. We're gonna go ahead and... There we go. We're all sorts of screwed up. The engine is rotated at this point. So now we have to find TDC before we can drop this in. And remember, the crank rotates twice to every one time the cam does. So you need to be mindful, and I'll show you here, but your timing marks will come up twice, and you can be 180 degrees off, but I'll show you how not to make that mistake. So here I've removed the cylinder one spark plug. Looks a little fouled, but not too bad. And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hold my finger over that spark plug hole, and we're looking for when the piston is coming up on the compression stroke, it's gonna be trying to push air past my finger and when it's doing that and our TDC mark is coming up on our harmonic balancer we know that we're on true TDC and we're not 180 degrees out so, so I am going to do this the redneck way here where normally I would use a wrench on the crank but in this case we're just going to jump the starter 
there we go you can hear it that's the compression stroke so I can see the timing marks coming up we're playing a game of cat and mouse here just barely touch it boom pretty close I think that'll be good but you saw you know when it's blowing air past your finger that's when you know you're on the compression stroke it's a lot easier to do with a crank but with all this tomfoolery on this engine you know if you know what you're doing you can get away with stuff like this just for the sake of you guys so you know what I'm talking about here you see I got the light you can see the pointer down there come on camera focus so our little timing pointer on our harmonic balancer and I was just bumping it around here and you can see that black mark down there is the TDC mark and I was just holding my finger under the plug hole until I felt air coming through there and I saw that pretty much lining up so let me do that again and then we'll move on so now we know we're on TDC of the compression stroke here you know wasn't all that bad some other provisions that are worth doing um, in the case of this FE I did run a tap down through the uh, distributor hold down bolt Pretty much, because you'll see when you get the distributor in here, um, it's a super tight angle. And folks have commented before, why don't I use one of these? You know, and you can tell I've had this guy for quite a while. And, you know, most of the time, it's not convenient for any one reason or another. And it mostly works for this, but it's not perfect. So the easier that the bolt can thread in, you know, which I clean that up as well, uh, you're just saving yourself a lot of headache. All right, so the first thing you want to do before you actually drop the distributor in is it's pretty handy to pop the cap on, trace out where spark plug wire number one is on the cap. It's hanging out over here and then mark that position. And so I apparently have already done that before in previous years, many moons ago in the dirt of the distributor itself. But now we have this point and that's going to be important because what we want, get our cap on there, maybe, there we go. What we want is when this distributor drops in, we want it pointing at where the spark plug wire number one is on the cap. So we're just gonna pre-clock it and it might take a few stabs. First of all, I gotta dodge this dumb AC thing. Okay, so now we're rotated. And if we're really lucky, the oil pump drive shaft be lined up but you're never that lucky. You can see right now, well, you can't, but I'll grab you here, but we're not engaging with the oil pump drive shaft. And this is where we want to be. So I'll show you what we're going to do about that. So, so if you can see down in here, um, way down in the center is the oil pump drive shaft, the distributor being what actually drives the oil pump um, being driven from the cam by the timing gears by the crank and so on so it looks like this little guy here and it's this hex pattern and what we're hitting on is this isn't wanting to go into the distributor we're gonna have to go down there and rotate ever so slightly and then it will drop in and I prefer to do this because again you know we can make concessions by dropping this distributor in clock slightly differently that's going to be potentially very difficult to set timing because we're just going to be fighting this vacuum advance on all this stuff the whole time so it's worthwhile to do and it's really easy and i'll show you here so what we have here is a very long extension with a quarter inch socket and this is going to engage perfectly with our oil pump drive shaft and you definitely want to take the extra second to tape this guy on you will absolutely ruin your day if you're lazy and you don't do it and that socket finds a way to fall out and end up down in the engine you'll just really regret this scenario so this is going to be a game of cat and mouse here we're just going to put a little tiny rotation on it pull it back out and then we're going to try and put our distributor in again and we're going to go back and forth until we get that distributor dropped in exactly where we want it so again we're hitting our oil pump drive shaft so back out she goes like i said it's a game of cat and mouse here there we go that's money fourth time is a charm patience goes a long way
So there we go, distributor's dropped in. It's fully seated. You would really ruin your day if you didn't have it fully seated and tried to start the engine. So um, it's very obvious to tell the difference if you're doing this in person. Our distributor is lined up with our cylinder one spark plug on the cap. And we have a wealth of adjustment here now with the advance on the distributor. So this is what we wanna see. And you can see just how hard it is to get that uh, distributor hold down back in there. So it pays dividends in scenarios like this to keep this stuff good and clean and clean out the threads. And there's some mechanic jokes associated with doing things of this nature, but I'll leave that to your imagination. And as you saw, I had to rotate the distributor out of the way to get that bad boy in because of this little flappy do oiler. But again, not a big deal if you have to do that. As you can see, boom, you rotate it right back into place. And now we can get our fancy distributor wrench that everyone always yells at me for not using. Take it till it's snug. That is too tight because we're still going to need to adjust it with the timing light here so just enough where we can rotate it but it's not going to fly all around with the engine running now i had the points set here before i installed the distributor is actually that's easier to do but for the sake of education i went ahead and loosened them up and we'll just do it right here so i'm going to rotate until this follower is up on a raised detent point whatever you want to call it the cam lobe for a cylinder here and so now we're up at the peak and this is the point where we're going to get our feeler gauge drop it in there and then tighten it back up and then our point gap will be set so here we are we have our 20 thousandths feeler gauge in and we have everything tightened down i'm a one-man show today so i'd like to show this in real time but you really need two hands to do this some things to note is you want to make sure that that ground strap, you don't get that all twisted around and in a bind. You see how this lays nice. That's pretty important. And then also, you just want to be mindful that the this part of the points here is actually sprung. So you want to make sure, you know, you're pushing the back side out and, you know, the, the back side way back here is moving because you could easily just be sliding your feeler gauge in and pushing this spring out and then you're not actually um, setting the point gap. So you want to check it when you're done. You know, I use 20 thousandths again because a lot of times you can't be perfect and it'll relax. 17 thousandths is always pretty okay. I've never had any issues with that with points. And you know, 20 thousandths, 24 thousandths, 17 thousandths. If you have a manual in front of you and you want to follow that, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. Uh, just every time you do set your point gap, you want to remember that it's going to affect your ignition timing. And so you want to get your timing light out after you mess with your point gap. So, you know, in this case, we're at about 20 thousandths. I think we're ready to start hooking stuff up. So it's never necessarily a bad idea to check your work at this point. And just for the sake of understanding how all this works, this is pretty handy. But basically what I've done is I've stolen the main coil wire from the coil here that goes to the distributor cap and I've put a spark plug on that and basically this is a very simple system all that's happening is the distributor is interrupting the ground to the coil and when that happens the coil discharges the spark now in the case of going right to a spark plug every time this happens eight times per rotation we should see this spark plug spark and it should be a nice blue heavy spark if we have our gap and everything set up correctly. So with that, we can just roll the engine over. And I want to point out that I don't have the keys in the ignition. And you'll see that that will still spark because of this lead right here. So again, this is just an auxiliary lead. When the coil has power, it bypasses the factory Ford resistive lead and sends a full 12 volts to the coil because of the voltage drop associated with rolling the starter over. So anyway, here we go. So 
So pretty cool. Everything looks good to that point. And you could see key out, you know, it was still sparking and everything looks good seemingly. Except for that fuel leak. That looks bad, but you know, open spark fuel leak. Yeah, what could go wrong? So the cab's back on here and everything's all good. That fuel leak is pretty significant. It looks like it's coming from the connection of this screw on fuel filter to the car. Seemingly, it could be the accelerator pump on this old 2100, but I don't know. If it catches on fire, we'll find out one way or another. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out is if you see how this choke flap is closed, this is really not the way you want it adjusted. So we're going to make an adjustment really quick. That guaranteed that would fight us when we go to start it. So it's just these three screws here. So normally you'd want to be somewhere there. If you have this all the way closed off, you know, it's just going to choke the thing out something terrible. But in the case of what we're doing today for kind of a first startup, I'm just going to have this thing good and open because we don't want to be fighting that as a variable. You know, if you can minimize the amount of variables you're working with, you're ahead of the game. I should probably move all of this, all of that but I'm not going to, so we'll know if it falls in the engine bay. I think we'll hear it. Here we go. All right, you saw it, you know, none of this was really that bad. Too often folks are afraid to get under the hood and do stuff like this. And you can see, you know, a little bit of know-how. It's really not too terrible. And maybe this video would be a guide for you. I don't know. I've done this stuff numerous times, but here it is for you again. Honestly, it's pretty straightforward as you can see. So we fired up right away on the first try and we're doing pretty good. Except for the whole asphyxiation thing. I think I'm gonna open the garage door. It's got the ballad of a thousand exhaust leaks because, you know, it's been in Iowa its entire life. It has a pretty unique one over here. And you can see this is a pretty low riding car and out on the backcountry roads I'm sure it bounced the exhaust off of something. Big old crack in the manifold. So you know that's what you want. Alright so the dial back timing light has joined the chat here and basically we're looking for that TDC mark and when it's lined up with our pointer the number we're seeing here is the ignition timing that the engine's at. So we're looking for zero on the balancer, but the number here is gonna tell us what our ignition timing is. So, here we go. Right now we're below zero. We're just gonna jump in here. You can see that it was obviously way late, responded pretty well. Still below zero. That's what the doctor ordered there. You can see how much ignition timing plays into all this stuff. That's at about 10 degrees going to give it a couple more. You see how much I had to move that thing? If I would have let it fall in where it wanted to, we would have been buttoned up to all this. And we wouldn't be able to do what we're trying to do here. All right. It's running pretty darn good here. Idling awful high. our curb idle screw down and uh, you can see that fuel leak starting to smoke so I don't think we'll push our luck let me fix that all right well we're doing pretty good I think that's a tremendous improvement recovery well uh, versus an engine that won't even run so obviously we're making good headway there you know I'm gonna miss this car when it's gone one thing I haven't mentioned in this video is I actually sold this car, but I ended up selling it to a neighbor. Now I hadn't done anything with it yet to this point, 
And, you know, just on my honor, I thought, you know, I want to make sure this thing isn't a burden for this guy. So, you know, I went through the thing and ultimately that resulted in us pulling the distributor out. But anyway, this is one of these moments here where you save something for 10 years and you think someday I'll use that. I'm not going to throw it away. And so this is from like two engines ago. And I've kicked this thing around in here for years. Hopefully it's still in here. Oh, I was actually cleaning out the toolbox. That's why I was aware it was here. So it's over on this side. But uh, skiddly do. The old F100 here had back in high school. Here's 2019 Power Tour with Derek and Kevin and all that stuff back in the day. Ta-da! I mean, this is from like two engines ago when I had a, a 2100 auto light on here. So convenient. And this is never a good sign. I don't know if you can hear this in the video. You can hear it wiggling around in the threads. More often than not, I mean, these 2100s, they're ancient at this point. And usually at some point in history, some Yeehaw McGee got on here, cross-threaded this thing, and just really mucked it up. So that's probably why it's leaking like a sieve. And it should definitely not be moving like that. So... Not good. Oh, and what do you know? Pretty much what we knew had happened. So cross-threaded, obviously leaking like a sieve. This is what it's not supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to look like. And more than likely, those threads are probably not quite threads anymore. And I kind of chuckled to myself back in the day when I bought this NPT tap set, but I've used it way more than I ever thought I would. So. That in there is an eighth inch NPT, and oh, what do you know? We happen to have one of those. Extra convenient, if we can fix it, that is. And this is fine. Definitely not getting a bunch of crap up in the needle and seat doing this. Mm, it starts now. Need to go a little bit farther to feel good about it. Get in there, little guy. There we go. Pretty deep, I think, at this point. If I can get it back out of there. Is this cleaning it out? Probably not, but it makes me feel better. All right, where are you at? Getting clutter vision, there we go. Ta-da! Are you gonna thread in? Oh, look at that. Money. Man, you can tell it's late at night here and I went to work all day. And I got to go to work in the morning because even my good old dominant hand is struggling to do dominant hand things at the moment. Just good enough to seal here, but not too tight. Oh, forgot the hose clamp. Doing great. All right, so I think with half of my entire toolbox laying under the hood of this car, I think we finally have done it, the distributor, the carb, and all of that, hopefully. What do you think, Mr. Wrench? Oh yeah, mate, I think you did a right fine job. Okay, I need to go to bed, holy cow. We'll start this thing here. Is there anything under the hood? I don't care. Probably not. I would never do such a deed. Ta-da! Please don't be leaking. Why would you do such a thing? Just about forgot to tighten up my distributor here, which luckily it was pretty tight so it wasn't going anywhere. But still, you can see how this stuff happens late at night. Like I said, the only time I've ever had stitches in my hand was I accidentally put my hand in the fan, you know. And it was at times like this where you're just not all mentally there. You're tired. It's late, you know. So with that, I am going to do the wrong thing the right way here. And I could tighten this up really tight, but if I crack this... I'm going to be really disappointed in my decision. 
Now it's against God and country to use thread tape on a carburetor, but you know, if you do it the right way, which I'll show you, um, you don't have any issues. It's when people do absurd things with thread tape, um, that's when all the issues happen. So the first thing with using thread tape here is you don't want to be on the first few threads. If you are, if you overhang, that's the stuff that gets into your carburetor and causes all sorts of issues. And so, and you want to start your tail. So when we're done here, you'll see since we're tightening it up um, in this way, our tail here will wrap over and it will actually tighten the thread tape where you can do it backwards and it'll unravel the thread tape. So you'll have to forgive me here. I'm left-handed. This is the world's ugliest thread tape. So there we go. The tail ended like such. So when we thread it in, it's not going to unravel the thread tape. And you see, we don't have anything over the first few threads. So there's really no way for this stuff to get into the carb. All right. Ta-da! Round two. Starts really nice now, naturally. Amazing what decent ignition timing will do. And also, ta-da, it's no longer leaking. So something I get asked a lot that seems to be an enigma with tuning engines is how do you know how much initial timing to give them. So now that we're up and running, the engine's warm, you know, we're not leaking fuel all over, so we're gonna burn down our garage, which would make my wife mad, you know, maybe irritate me ever so slightly. Uh, I'll show you here, but a vacuum gauge is very helpful. So our vacuum gauge is hooked up to our ported port. And as you see here, we have 10 inches of mercury. And the ported port is nothing more than timed vacuum. It's manifold vacuum everywhere except for your idle position. If you're seeing vacuum on it at your idle setting, you have too much curve idle. So I'll show you here, we're gonna lower it. See how that's dropping? That's about where we would want to be. We're just going to go to the onset of vacuum. So there we go. That's probably pretty good. And you might say, well, now my RPM's too low. Now watch this. This just goes to show how interconnected ignition and carbs are. Okay, so this is where you get in here and it's like, oh, how much initial timing do I need? See how the engine RPM picked up, how it'll respond? See that? Obviously this would be too late. Engine RPM picks up. So the initial ignition timing it takes to idle with the correct RPM for your curve idle screw to have zero inches of mercury on the ported port is the initial ignition timing you should be using for everything to work together harmoniously and correctly. This stuff looks like voodoo black magic, but as you can see, there's a few identifiers that are just dead ringer, dead giveaways for the way things want to be, the way the engine wants to be. You can look at a book all day, but at the end of the day, the engine is going to tell you what it wants. And those are some of the metrics you can look at to interpret what it's asking for. All right, my friends, so this is day three of working on the car, and I noticed something interesting last night when I shut the engine down after we had fixed this filter issue where, you know, previously it had been leaking. And, you know, leaking is bad, but it also was bleeding off the pressure. And so once we sealed that up and the line would stay pressurized between the pump and carb, you know, a new issue revealed itself, interestingly enough. And, you know, if you're a working stiff like me, this is probably how you guys end up working on things, you know, little bits at a time. 
you know, as an adult, you have like little chunks of time that you get to actually get things done uh, as far as hobbies go. So, you know, you just kind of got to piecemeal your time together and make the best of the time that you have. So, so I'll fire the old Mercury up and show you exactly what I'm talking about here. I imagine at this point with a good battery and some decent ignition timing in it, it probably starts okay. So we'll give it a little tap. Not too bad. That's the good stuff. So I'll let the Tim get up here, and this is when this issue is really going to rear its ugly head here. And probably a lot of you guys with classic cars have experienced this, and you know you haven't been able to track it down to this being the source. So you know this might be some good info for you guys out there that drive around this old garbage much like I do. I wonder if the radio works in this thing. Old mono speaker on the dash. The devil, yeah. And, and how, how do you break cocaine? And he goes, I just look up, man. He goes, there are no old cocaine addicts. <laughs> Good motivation. It takes your soul, man. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get back to what we were doing. Okay, and a really weird thing about this car is there is something under the carpet right here like an item and I'm not sure if someone cut it in because I, I can't get it out. I'm gonna have to try and pull it out or cut it out. But something very interesting right in this area that is not part of the floor. So I thought I was gonna have to cut it here. And so it's like someone intentionally cut this and here's all the way under the carpet. A pair of glasses, maybe? A pair of safety glasses. There's more under here. Uh, the squirrels have been here. Okay, this was a squirrel house, apparently. Is that everything? Darn. I was hoping we'd find something cool. I guess that was kind of unique, but you know, maybe like a $20 gold piece or something, but I guess not. Man, she's idling nice and steady. You can balance a nickel on it. Well, mostly. Not bad for some old wore out FE. If I block the fan, it sure can. Not bad. So I want you to notice the vacuum gauge is hooked to the ported port, also known as the timed vacuum port. And when you give it RPM, it then becomes manifold. So I actually have the 2100's big brother here, the 4100, and I'll show you exactly what's going on. There's a huge misconception about ported or timed vacuum that just isn't true. So if we take our 4100 auto light here, we make sure the choke is open. We flip the carburetor upside down. You'll see this vacuum port here. It is the only port for vacuum advance on this carburetor. And so you can see the channel here it runs in and you can see that little hole on your left and that right there is the ported port. And the reason it's ported is when you're at idle, like you are right now with the choke off, that port is not exposed to vacuum. As soon as you open the throttle here, it's exposed and it acts exactly like manifold vacuum. They are the same thing, except for at idle, it's not adding advance to your distributor. So that's kind of a look at a 64 right there and the 67 is the same exact way. 
And again, I'll leave the link below if you want to do a deep dive into this manifold versus ported vacuum advance. But to sum it up, you know, it allows you to run a much more aggressive mechanical advance initial timing. Um, basically, that phase shifts the advance curve up. And, you know, it's not about having more advance, it's more timing. It's just about having the right timing. And so, you know, when you step on the throttle really hard, vacuum advance obviously goes away and you're just on your mechanical timing. And oftentimes, if you're running manifold vacuum, it's adding so much timing at idle that you have to compensate by reducing initial mechanical. And then when you stomp on it, you just have late uh, mechanical timing that has sub-ideal performance. Using ported, you're able to run a more aggressive advance curve and you just have way more power when you're hard into the throttle. And it seems like Ford had this figured out and a lot of other manufacturers did as well. And again, this was way before emissions, so it's really not valid. All right, I think our engine's good enough to temp here. It's a healthy little 390. More like a big 390. One of the good years back when, oh, they still had good compression in 67. Shuts right down nice. And now you're going to see this issue. And I'm All right, we're going to swing this out of the way, maybe. So you can kind of see it starting. So what's happening here is when it's shut down, it has this metal line, mechanical fuel pump. This is a deadhead system, so it can't flow backwards. Fuel today is really volatile. It's sitting in this line, it's heating up, it's expanding. And as it's expanding, it's opening up the needle and seat. So we're blowing fuel into the carb. Plus, just sitting here with this uh, intake manifold spacer, which I'll get to that in a moment, but it's causing excessive heat in the carb. You know, it's very hot to the touch and it's boiling this fuel over and it's actually boiling over through the boosters, dropping down in the engine. I'll show you the issue associated with that in a moment. But Ford was really keen on these spacers that you can see the coolant is actually running through it. The idea was to keep the carb and everything to warm it up quick, keep everything at like a static, temperature. A carburetor is a static metering system in a dynamic environment. So back in the day, they went through a lot of effort to keep all of the external variables consistent. And it isn't to say that engineers back in the day didn't know what they were doing. The fuel they were working with being leaded and everything was different. The fuel blend was different. It just wasn't as volatile uh, to changing density and everything with heat like fuels of today. And so as you can see, this carb is struggling with this quite a bit in this spacer that's running coolant through it, which makes everything really hot, is really just basically pouring gasoline on the fire in this scenario, no pun intended. You can see the smoke coming out of the Venturi uh, throttle bore area there, you know. Wow, it's really going. And that's just boiling over into the engine. Now this gets called vapor lock a lot, and it isn't. What it's actually doing is it's flooding the engine out. So if you've ever driven one of these old cars, gone into a store, and then, you know, like 15, 20 minutes or so, you come back out and try and start the engine, and it just won't start. It cranks and cranks and cranks. This is what you have going on, and this is what you're dealing with. Not to mention that that's just outright hard on an engine. You know, that's going down the cylinders, washing the walls, getting down into your engine oil, contaminating it, diluting it. You know, these are all bad things that really you want to avoid. So this is under the hood of the Maverick here. This is my daily driver, what I drive to work every day. You know, it's got a carb cheater on it and so on and so forth. But what it also has is one of these nice insulative carb spacers in between the intake manifold and carb. And that really does a good job to keep the heat off the carb you know, the cooler you can keep your carb, the better overall it's going to perform and the better it's going to deal with this heat soak scenario. So especially, you know, like that when you're running 
engine coolant through your spacer, especially when it's just sitting and getting hot. That's like, you know, coming at it negatively from a couple angles there. But, you know, these make a big difference. We actually sell these as standalone pieces on our carb cheater website, or you can buy them from anywhere. I don't really care, but, you know, it makes a big difference running an insulative carburetor spacer with today's fuels. You can see that all that factory stuff just isn't working anymore. So the carburetor's all reassembled here. We've sat for 15 or 20 minutes, so I guarantee you we're going to experience this scenario that probably many of you oh, have in the past before too. Now this car is definitely not going to light right off now. And one of the things that's perpetuated on the internet now is when a carbureted car won't start, the obvious answer is just to jump up and down, you know, full yeehaw cowboy style on the gas pedal and that's supposed to help it start you know in this case it's flooded out and that's probably about the last thing you want to do so you can see it's just not going to pop off and you can crank 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 run down your battery and to get yourself in a worse and worse predicament what you want to do is you want to take your little foot put it to the floor this is going to blow out this super rich mixture and as soon as it lights you're going to lift and here we go And now you're running. So you get in this scenario, that's something to think about. If you're cranking, 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 you just drove your car and won't start. Probably had this happen, pull her to the floor, she'll light right off. And then seemingly as if there was never anything wrong, it's going to run completely normal yet again. And again, all that tomfoolery goes away if you just use some sort of an insulative carb spacer to keep the heat from the engine off of the carburetor. It's actually pretty simple when you know what's going on with it and pretty easy to correct. And with that it's like 11 o'clock at night again so uh, I'm gonna go to bed. I gotta go to work in the morning. Um, I'll see you guys tomorrow or the following day whenever I have time to get back to this and we're getting close to finishing this thing off and hitting the road you know. It's just a casual wrench when I have free time project that you know just having fun going through it and teaching you guys what I know, you know, hopefully it can help you. These are just many things that I wish someone would have taught me when I started out, you know, it would have been a lot easier. I went through the school of hard knocks, so, you know, maybe you guys don't have to. All right, my friends, it's day three. The sun is shining, the birds are chirping. It's a nice day outside, which is a pretty pleasant change from every day of rain we've had this week. So let's get this thing wrapped up here. So I've already taken the liberty here to reroute the coolant lines. Originally one went from this port on the intake directly into the spacer. 
and then out the back of the spacer to this port. I simply just removed this, cut this down, and went from the intake right to this connection here. So we've effectively bypassed the spacer, and we're going to keep a lot of heat off our carb that way. And we'll fire it up and test that out, but I can almost guarantee you that we're not going to be boiling fuel in the carburetor any longer. So with that, let's light her off and see if that fixed that issue. All right, here we go. I can never remember which key it is. There we go, we'll give it a little pump and... Belt squeal, naturally. It starts up and runs pretty decent now. So I'm gonna let this thing get a little bit of temp. Um, why don't we go through the mix screws, you know, once it gets warmed up and then we'll shut it down and I'll show you that our carburetor issue has effectively been fixed, at least as far as the boiling fuel in the bowl and, you know, flooding the engine out, which, again, just super hard on everything. You really don't want to do that. Diluting your oil, you know, just really cuts back the life of your engine ultimately. And it's just annoying to deal with. And I want to mention something here that, you know, this type of stuff is your nemesis on old engines. So when I pulled this off to put the vacuum gauge on, this just crumbled in my hand. Stuff like this makes people hate classic cars. And you have to remember, you're not fighting the classic car at this point. You're fighting old technology, which was actually pretty good. But your biggest thing that's going to irritate you is you're fighting time. You know, something like this would have been fine back in the day, but after, you know, 50 some odd years, obviously this is petrified and junk just going to cause you issues so you really want to scrutinize an engine and make sure you don't have any bad vacuum lines you know it's just going to be a nightmare to get tuned and really frustrate you all right we're doing pretty good here so this on the gauge is actually 20 inches of mercury, and that is a super healthy 390 FE at this point. Just amazing that it came back after all that. Love it. Now, I've said this in other videos, but it's a huge misconception that you adjust mixed screws to the highest vacuum. If you do that, you're going to be too lean. Generally, you want to go too rich to start out with and lean it up as you go, which we've done here. And basically, as you lean the engine, there will be a point when the vacuum goes up and then it steadies out. Now that first instance of where it goes up and then it doesn't respond to a movement, you want to go an eighth turn richer from there, which is the Part of this process that everyone seems to forget, they talk about on the internet, they totally leave that out. Extremely important because once you put your air filter on, shut your hood, and engine heat takes hold, you're gonna be too lean if you don't do that. So on the first onset of where vacuum steadies out, you wanna go an eighth turn richer, and you'll be all set up. Now here's a good one for you guys, check this out. Now again, this is ported vacuum, there's no vacuum on it right now. Reds out really nice. Let's hook this guy up. Now check this out. Pretty bad. So something weird going on here with the vacuum advance. see the vacuum advance moving the advance plate which for light load scenarios when your throttle really isn't um, very open you know you're not getting a very dense air and fuel charge into the cylinder the burn times longer and so to burn the mixture at the right time vacuum advance comes into play and then when you hammer on the throttle vacuum drops and then you're just on your mechanical timing you know all of this is an attempt just to ignite the mixture at the right time in the cylinder stroke which Actually, fuel-injected cars work much the same way. They just use a map sensor and some other things versus this pretty cool mechanical system, really. But all of that 
considered. I had reused this vacuum advance from our broken distributor. The previous owner had bought that and put it on, you know, probably some of the reason it didn't run very well. I would have loved to have used the original one, but this one's from 1964 and seen better days. It's completely petrified, so that wasn't gonna work out. Now, before we get too disappointed in our distributor scenario, let's look at some of the things we've overcome and achieved. Now, see, we're sitting here heat soaking, and you can still see the needle and seat assembly bubbling over a little bit, you know, naturally. We have a metal line. The fuel pump itself is attached to the hot block here after it's ran and got fully up to temp. So, you know, you still have that going on, but what you don't see is the fuel in the actual bowl boiling. I can get down here and actually hold my hand on the carburetor spacer here. So, you know, quite a bit better. And obviously now we're not gonna be, notice there's none boiling over into the engine. And so that whole hard to start after you parked it 20 minutes, all of that weird stuff guaranteed is effectively gone. It's the little victories along the way that make all this stuff fun. So it looks like we're just down to this vacuum advance and then, I don't know, I think we got a pretty darn good running engine, guys. I think we can get this handled real quick. Now, I really do not like adjustable vacuum advance canisters, but we'll make do with what we have here. And so I can see that this is adjusted all the way clockwise. And if you're wearing your gorilla hands, throw those away. Because if you get in here and get buck wild, you'll just break these things. So it's all the way clockwise at the moment, which is probably why it's adding an egregious amount of timing. And so basically we wanna go all the way counterclockwise, which basically takes the advance to zero here. Unfortunately, you see I had to move the distributor, so we'll be getting the timing light out again. So it seems like this vacuum advance canister has minimal adjustment. So all the way from one way to the other is six turns. Suffice it to say, I'm gonna try and start at two and a half turns and see where that is. And I'm hoping that's somewhere in the 10 to 15 range and then I'll be pretty happy with it and willing just to live with it, at least to initially drive around. Kind of precarious to do with one hand. Two rotations. We're just gonna point this over this direction. And technically, that is two and a half. And what do you know, it's stuck. Can we just rotate this more, get this out of the way? Okay, fun stuff. Thank you, AC compressor. All right, do a quick check here. That is much better. It takes noticeably more vacuum to move it and it doesn't move quite as far. I don't like these because you're adjusting not only the vacuum uh, threshold, but also the amount of timing it has in it. You know, they're just kind of squirrely, but I think we're at least a good starting point. And if you're gonna work on old cars, you cannot be afraid of ignition timing. You know, it'll make or break how well an engine runs. So before I move this, I kind of thought ahead just to get her close. I made a mark on the intake right in line with our coil wire here. This should still be Good and warm at this point. Let's see how good the rest of everything else is. Good boy. Pulling a, let's just pull a full turn out of it counterclockwise. So it should be less and, oh, we're stuck again. Come on, there we go. All right. That's why this mark is gonna be really convenient. Obviously I kind of get this to where it needs to be with the timing light when I first start it up. And then I check how much the vacuum advance is pulling. Once I start, Sucking on that line, obviously, it starts adding timing via vacuum advance. We're getting closer here. Gonna go counterclockwise 
for another half a turn. Let's go three quarters of a turn and see where that gets us. And once again, that's just the right amount of rotation to not be able to get this out of here. What do you know? There we go. What a pain. Back to your home, kind of. At least relative, so we can start it up. my friends perseverance always wins the day so I don't think it gets a whole lot better than that it's idling with 20 inches of mercury we hook the vacuum advance in and rev the engine it no longer kills the engine it has 32 33 degrees of mechanical timing 14 or 15 degrees of initial timing and it's really happy with that and uh, you know it's a reasonable initial timing number it's a reasonable total timing number and our vacuum advance is adding about 14 degrees while cruising, which is a pretty ideal number and easy to work with. So, you know, I don't know. I think we're doing pretty good at this point. That is how an FE is supposed to run. Just like that, my friends. Doesn't get any better than that. probably would have been advantageous to put all this stuff away as I went along, but you know. It just never ceases to amaze me what an FE engine can come back from, you know, just absolute definition of neglect. And now it's idling with 20 inches of mercury, crisp throttle response. You, I mean, you can balance a coin on the thing, you know, I can't really imagine that when it rolled off the factory, you know, 50 some odd years ago, that it was a whole lot better than this, if at all. So, you know, pretty darn cool. And I hope you learned something in this process. You know, I tried to go through it in an understandable way. You can see that it's not hard to work on, you know. It's just mostly know-how and interpreting what you're seeing and then, you know, making the right moves. And you can have yourself a pretty darn good running old classic car and engine. You know, I feel bad that everyone's always scared of this stuff. And it's, it's really a lot of fun and... You know, as you saw, not too bad. You know, like a modern car, you got to turn yourself into a pretzel to work on anything. It's terrible. This stuff, real easy. And I'm kind of disappointed I'm selling this car. I mean, everything works on this car. Super sad. Um, I have already sold it to the guy. And just on my honor, I wanted to go through and make sure it was going to be a decent car for him. Had I done all this stuff before I sold it, you know, I might have fallen in love and not been able to. So... You know, I think with that, I'm going to get all these tools picked up here off the cowl and then back this thing out of here. I think we're doing pretty good. One thing that's always sad is when you get a car tuned well, it generally quiets down quite a bit. Um, it's just because everything is running super efficient and in time and clean you know i mean this engine has a big old broken manifold right here and you know it's not loud at all it doesn't smell all right apparently 
if someone was doing a little bit of water witching once upon a time. Now the brakes aren't amazing in this car. It has a nice popping ball joint. Always a concern. I guess I should tell you that the guy who's buying it, he just wanted the driveline for his 68 Galaxy. That's why it was so invested in getting the engine and transmission stuff kind of squared away. Because that's ultimately the only reason he wants the car. I might just have to get this car back. It's a pretty neat old rig. Obviously the brakes aren't good, so we're just going to hammer it, no pedaling it or nothing. Not too bad. And there's my neighbors wondering what the heck I'm doing. Alright, she's doing pretty good. I like it. I'm going to miss having this car around. Even, even though I never had it before. But as of right now, I'm gonna miss having this car around. All right, going on a little road trip here to go see my old friend, the tank, in the middle of a town center because, you know, tanks in a town center make total sense. sense to me a nice sunny beautiful day to go on a little joyride here down to town and this runs so good it goes 55 mile an hour you know probably 70 80 mile an hour knowing how these fe's and these tall rear ends and these three speeds go but yeah it's a happy little engine now which makes me happy Everyone should have one of these in their town. All right, my friends, thanks for coming along with me today. I hope you learned something. Uh, we went through a lot of systems and I tried to really go through it and lay it out. So thanks for coming along and I'll catch you guys for the next one. I'm gonna go deliver this to its new owner.